Thank you. Good morning, Elm Europe. Uh, as on screen, if you've got a laptop or um, mobile device handy, in, in about five, five to ten minutes, um, we'll be playing a game together. Uh, but before we do that, uh, my name is Mario, uh, and I'm talking about Elm as a Service today, something, uh, a side project that myself and Philip have been working on uh, for a couple of years now, actually, and so we're really excited uh, to be able to present that to you today. Uh, so just to, uh, I guess, set some context, uh, I've found myself um, looking at Elm in unusual domains the last couple of years. Uh, currently, uh, I'm working for a company called Concordium. Uh, we're building a next generation blockchain specifically targeted at fixing some of the kind of enterprise and institutional uh, use case problems that aren't currently facilitated on current chains. Uh, so we have a partnership with uh, Aarhus University in Denmark uh, with the uh, uh, cryptography and science research teams there uh, making a whole bunch of innovations and changes. Uh, but the one that's relevant to Elm uh, is a, a language, a new language for smart contracts that we've been working on, uh, which is actually a fork of Elm. It is called Oak, a delightful language for reliable smart contracts. Um, so the, the really interesting thing in, in, in working on this project has been uh, uh, how uh, some of the concepts within Elm, uh, namely uh, purity um, and uh, immutability, uh, have uh, translated into other domains. Uh, so I'm not talking about Oak today, um, uh, but it is a really interesting project. So uh, myself, um, Philip, and Tom uh, are all here from Concordium. So if you're interested in this, please do come and talk to us. We are also hiring. So if you want to work on compiler level stuff, definitely come and speak to me. Uh, but what I'm talking about today uh, is another project um, that is Elm in an unusual domain. And it's actually the, the side project that myself and Philip uh, were working on that actually ended up us uh, landing landing jobs at Concordium. So it all starts with this man. Uh, some of you may know, it, know him. This is uh, um, Matt Griffith. Uh, and he's the author of Elm UI. Um, but originally, uh, this is from the, his 2017 talk. Uh, originally, it was called uh, Stylish Elements. And... Uh, this was kind of the first, the first uh, glimpse for me uh, as to the, the nature of the kind of problem that I'd been struggling with or trying to solve throughout my career. And what really blew me away with what Matt did was he, he, he kind of stepped back from the problem of CSS and, and, and posed the question, well, what, what if we were to redo it from scratch, what are the primitives that we would want? Like, what, what are the core things that we'd want to think in terms of and how do we model those? Um, and as I'm sure many of you will know, the, the, the urban legend that uh, following this talk, an emoji was uh, forged uh, in Matt's honor, namely the mind-blown emoji. Um, totally true, all that. Um, this further kind of sunk in for me uh, uh, with Richard's talk at ReactiveConf, and he articulated what, why this was so insightful, at least for me, why it seemed so insightful. It's we had a whole bunch of things that were keeping CSS semantic, so it's like, you know, we, we've got this thing, and it's just, if only there's a better way for us to deal with it, so we'd try and layer tools and, and things on top of it. Uh, and then in terms of having no relation to CSS, things that go, okay, well, what, what if we use CSS as a, as a, as a target? Um, what, what, what could kind of happen there? And in a way, it's exactly the same thing that Elm's done. You know, Elm has gone, okay, well, what if we didn't keep JavaScript semantics? What, what would we kind of want in, the, in a front-end language? So this, this, this notion of this idea um, kind of tied me to this question that I'd be asking myself throughout my career. It's like, oh, if only I had a better CSS framework. And if I'm to kind of stretch this analogy a little bit, maybe unfairly, it's kind of a bit like, you know, when people are like, oh, if only we had a faster horse. And if we kind of like just kept on that for ages, we would have just gotten incrementally faster horses, but maybe would have never discovered the car. Now, mind you, the car today has a particular context for us. You know, governments have invested in roads. They're quite prolific. But the early cars were pretty bad. You know, like, it's like it, it, it was possible to see why not everybody was convinced it might be a thing. Uh, but, but in any case, the exploration, uh, I think, uh, had value at that time and, and, and resulted in something new and interesting by not assuming that we just needed a faster horse. So I'd like to motivate you with a problem. Now, this is a problem that I've had for myself. And uh, what I'm talking about today is really a problem that Philip and I uh, have been trying to solve for ourselves primarily. So worst case, we'll have a solution for ourselves. And maybe no one else has this problem, but I, but I hope you might. Uh, so here's, here's how the, um, the kind of scenario plays out for me. Uh, I have a lot of ideas, a lot of apps and things that I want to build. So let's say I think of a, a new idea, an amazing idea, and I get really excited to build this idea. And I start, I'm quite visual, so I start thinking in my head, oh, it's going to look like this, and it's going to work like this, and these are how the things are going to lay out. Uh, and of course, you know, as we've heard Evan say, like code is the easy part. 
Uh, so as always, I go, sweet, let's do the easy part first. Dive into the code, um, start like doing up the front end screens, getting really excited about it all. And then you get to this point where you're like, ah, oh, like back end, like I need persistence now. And you're like, okay, so I've got Elm, Elm's good. Um, I like Elm. Well, I need something for the back end. Uh, and then I'm gonna need something for storage. Um, what, what am I going to use there? Like, you know, GraphQL, I've heard that's a thing. Is that even storage? I don't know. Maybe I need to research that. Querying, like, you need to query stuff back and forth. So if I use Postgres, maybe, like, I need to choose a backend that has a good language support for it. Like, maybe Ruby. Oh, but, like, do I want to use Ruby again? I'm not sure. Oh, uh, well, on the front end, fine. Well, you know, I've got JSON encoders. They're part of Elm, so I guess I should use JSON. But what about this protobufs thing? Is that, like, cool or... I don't know. What about the transport layer? I guess there's HTTP, but there's JSON API. Like SOAP, is SOAP still a thing? Maybe SOAP got good, I don't know. And so, you know, you, you get to this, I find I get to this point where I'm, I'm considering suddenly all these other, other things. Oh, and there's hosting and deployment. I just completely forgot about. Hmm. So three days later, I, I usually find myself with, you know, 100 tabs open and I've read all about Kafka and I know way too much about GraphQL. And I've kind of like, I've, you know, I've lost, I've lost the, the, the kind of excitement of that original project I had. So I had found myself with a lot of kind of front-end projects, so a lot of things just kind of half-started that um, after a while the complexity kind of ballooned and, and I wasn't as excited uh, to, to continue pushing through with it. Um, so let's say maybe you're not as, as, as finicky as me and you've got a stack that you like. So let's say you like, um, you know, sticking with JSON API perhaps and, and you've got Ruby on the back end with Postgres. And so you go, okay, cool. Well, I've made those choices. Now I can actually start implementing my idea. Except first I'll just have to write some of those encoders for my front end model. And then uh, we'll go write some HTTP stuff in Elm. So we got to do the HTTP stuff on the server side and make sure that connects. And I think you're slowly getting the point of what I'm getting at, right? Like every single one of these boxes um, is uh, what I'm calling, a, it's like a semantic boundary. So the semantics between these things are different. So we need transformation code or glue code. So we end up inevitably writing all of this glue all over the place that isn't actually related to the core idea that we're building. Like it doesn't have value to that specific idea. It's more about integrating those um, disparate components. So. The project that Philip and I have been working on um, to solve this has been kind of tackling that same question I was asking before, but from a web development stack. So I'd kind of always been thinking like, oh, if only I had a better web development stack. And so every new technology that would come out, whether it's you know, GraphQL is the one that's sticking to mind currently, but whatever new thing might come out, whatever new framework, I would always get excited and be like, oh, this will be the one, this will be the one that would fix it. And it, and it never really did, and I couldn't figure out why. So uh, the so that we're presenting today uh, is called Lambda, um, and current tagline is a new set of primitives for web development. So ideally what our style elements is to CSS, we're hoping Lambda will be to web development. So that's all kind of high level. Um, maybe as a motivating factor, let's uh, dive in and play a game together. So this game was built uh, entirely on Lambda, and it's called Red vs. Blue, so if you've got your phones or your laptops handy. And before we dive in, I'm just going to tell you quickly some facts about this game, and then we'll play it, and hopefully you'll believe my facts. Um, so this game is about 500 lines of Elm. That's including all of the front end, the game logic, everything that's in it. It's front end and back end. Um, so it's got a persistent back end. If you were to reload, don't, don't reload during the game, because there's a thing that'll kick you out, so don't do that. But just trust me that there's persistence there. Um, but some caveats. There's no encoders and decoders in any of the source code at all. There's no network or API call, so there's no manual web socket handling, there's no HTTP calls in there, nothing of that sort. Um, and there's no DB querying code, so there's no like SQL calls or, or API calls to save and retrieve state. Okay? So. Let's dive in. I'll tell you how to play. So uh, a reminder, it was split.lambdero.app if you didn't catch that URL, but it'll be up again in, on screen in a second. Uh, so this is how the game works. The game's called Red vs. Blue. Very simple. You pick red or you pick blue in time, and the time will be me counting down. The minority stays in. So the majority group gets kicked out. Okay? Then we'll just repeat that. And eventually, the most unique person at Elm Europe will win. And the award will be this French Kinder Surprise. 
Okay, so if you want to pull up, uh, split the lambda error to app. All right, is anybody not connected yet? Anyone still? All right. Give you another couple seconds to join. Okay, I'm gonna call it. So this will be quite quick. You gotta be on your feet. I'm just gonna do a manual counter, okay? And so there's an extra psychological element to this. All right, you ready for this? I'm playing as well. So you will get to see what I choose. But is everyone else picking what I choose? Or are they picking not what I choose? All right, all right, so starting first round, off we go. All right, so round ending in three, two, one. Oh, I'm out. Okay, we've got 31 players left. Okay, so we'll let those players pick. We'll give you three, two, one. Oh, five players left. That was a big split. All right, I hope those players are chosen. Knocking them out in three, two, one. <laughs> we got players rejoining us? I don't know, how's that working? I don't know, let's, let's, let's keep rolling. Three, two, one. Oh, final round. Three, two, one. Yeah. So we got, someone's got a winning screen on their phone somewhere? Yes, congratulations. All right, so hopefully that, that uh, motivates you to believe some of the facts that we just claimed. Um, so let me, let me kind of run through uh, how this works. So uh, the way I'd like to do this is by kind of stepping back and thinking about, um, thinking about if we were to try and model web development as a specification, um, or at least a particular kind of web development, maybe a, a simplified kind. So the one that you'll be, the parts of the spec that you'll probably be familiar with is uh, this notion of the front end, and you've got some state on your front end, and you've got some events that happen on your front end. Right? And many of you will probably recognize this because this is actually how Elm directly models the front end. You know, in terms of modeling this as types, we take our state and we call that a type called model, and we take the events and we call that a type um, of message usually, right? Uh, then Elm kind of gives us the, the plumbing to manage that truth. Uh, so what I'd propose is that when we think about the back end, it's actually exactly the same. So we've got some sort of state on the back end, and we have a whole bunch of events that can happen on the back end. In some ways, it's not too different. So the missing piece then is, okay, we've got this front end thing, and we've got this back end thing, but then what? You know, two disparate entities uh, that don't talk to each other isn't, isn't super interesting. Um, so we could maybe conceptually say, okay, well, there's events that happen from the front end to the back end. You could think of them as messages, or you could think of them as data transfer, or you know, we, we generally wouldn't say like an on-click is a message, an on-click is an event, and fire is a message, but you know, there may be conceptually things that happen from the front end that want to drive something on the back end, in whichever way that is. And there may be things that happen on the back end that want to drive something on the front end. So, in the way that we've been thinking about this, these are the six baseline primitives that we've been able to find, and this is kind of the simplest level that we've been able to get to. And so far, it seems that you can model everything that you want on top of these six primitives. So, let's do what we do in Elm. Let's take that specification and try and model those primitives as types. So, if we were to take the front end, this will be familiar to most of you. We'll put a model on there, and then we've got a message type that kind of comes back in, and that's in a simplified form, what a front-end LMAP is. So we're just going to make this a little bit more specific in this case, because we're going to have more than one message type firing around, so I'm going to call this one front-end message. Now, the second part of this then is, well, let's think about the back-end. So we said it's got a state, and it's got some events that happen, so maybe we model that in the same way. Let's call it the model type. Let's come up with a back-end message. 
and now we've got the front end and the back end. So the question is, okay, we've got two sets of events left, those that go to the back end, those that go to the front end. Well, we already have a mechanism for modeling events, and that's messages. So let's create another message type for things that go to the back end, and another message type for things that go to the front end. And that's it. That's all that Lambda error is. So now the plumbing. You'll know the view and the update function from Elm. Well, on the back end, there's no person there. There's no kind of user, so we don't really need the view function. So we just drop that one off. And then the final missing part of this is, well, we know that uh, the update function signature takes a message type, right? And so if we replicate that in the back end, this update function here in the back end will take the back end message type. But we've got two additional message types that are currently unhandled. So how do we deal with those? And so the way that we've approached this is we had two additional update functions. So now we've got an update from back end and an update from front end. The question that's been asked is, why not simply have just the front end message and just the back end message and have each one call each other? Um, that would be one way to do it. In fact, you could still implement uh, that uh, in this method. Uh, the strange thing that would happen, though, is then suddenly your back end is able to issue front end commands like user clicked button, which is a little bit weird. Uh, and conversely, your front end may be able to execute back end messages like admin definitely destroyed database, which you probably don't want. Um, so in, th in thinking about like the semantics of the pieces, uh, we kind of found that usually what you're transporting between the front end and the back end is a different thing. They're different kinds of events and they have different sets of data in them towards the states and events that happen on either side of the app. Okay, so the missing bit, bit then is how does this transport actually work? Like how do we think about this uh, in terms of the usage within Elm? And the simple answer is we have a function. So this is a simplified signature. Um, the actual signature has got a couple more parameters in there to tweak specific things, but conceptually, I'm just going to keep it at this for now. Uh, so this notion of send to backend. So we had a message type of to backend that is the same as a normal uh, L message type, and we'll show, show you a, an example of that in a second. Uh, but you simply put the message that you want in there, and you get a command back that'll send that to the backend, and that's it. How do you send it to the front end? Well, same thing from the backend. You've got a... Uh, Function. This one takes a client ID because we want to know which of our front ends. There's only one back end, but there may be many front ends. Which of our front ends we want to send to. And then we've got a to front end message. And we put a value in there, um, and we get a command message that we can use in our update functions. And that's it. We don't see any of the underlying stuff, any of the underlying transport. Uh, what this kind of translates to is the same way as when you set an on-click handler uh, onto, onto an HTML element. You don't really think about what's happening behind the scenes. When you click that button, conceptually, we just assume that that message somehow makes it to our update function. You don't think about the fact that Elm is attaching event handlers, that it might could be converting that label to some sort of string, that it's passing that string and interpolating and doing that kind of stuff. Like conceptually, we have this freedom to go, okay, the on-click is this message, and I can think of it like that conceptually. Uh, and it's the same thing in Lambda. Uh, you just assume that, that whatever that value is on the front end will just appear for us in the back end. So in terms of the glue problem, and this is the bit that we're um, really excited about, um, we say, okay, let's start with Elm and Lambda are there and see kind of what it eats up. Well, it's covering off the front end side of things. Um, the encoding is automatic. The transport is handled for us. We simply say we want this message value to be on the back end. The decoding uh, is taken care of. Back end is subsumed by it. Storage kind of isn't there, and then we say the hosting and deployment is kind of part of it as well. And so the, the premise here is that you no longer have a whole bunch of boxes because the boxes have gaps and the gaps need glue. Um, instead, we've got kind of one system. Uh, so we think, and it seems so far in, in the apps that we've been building, that there is no glue code at all. There is no code that you have to write in this scenario that transforms from one kind of semantic domain into another one, you simply just go and straight write the actual stuff that you need for your app, as opposed to gluing together specific things. And that's what we're really, really excited about. So let me motivate you perhaps with a bunch more demos of um, some stuff that we've been building uh, in the last couple of weeks, um, so we can see how this all fits together. I'm not going to do these uh, as live demos interactively uh, with you guys. I'm just going to have Philip down here at the front um, uh, joining me on them. But every single one of these demos is a multiplayer demo in a sense. So it's all it's all um, mass user. Okay. So the first demo uh, we're going to talk about is a multi-user counter app. So 
Most of you will probably be familiar with the Elm canonical example, and I'm going to show you this source code briefly as well. Uh, so, it's fairly straightforward counter app. If I decrement, it goes down. If I increment, it goes up. Uh, the difference with this app, though, is that um, if Philip loads this app up uh, and increments and decrements, <laughs> um, uh, we've kind of got, it's the same global counter. So what I've done here is I've, I've, uh, we've, we've extended the counter app example to have a backend. That backend holds the counter. And instead, our front end is sending the increment decrement values to the backend. So we've kind of got um, a global lock. So you know I can go down and Philip can go up and we can fight each other for domination over the counter. Um, so that's the first one. So let me, uh, this, this code is the simplest, probably the least overwhelming. Um, so I'm going to just dive into this briefly um, and, and uh, use this to explain. So as with most Elm apps, Usually, at least for me, I, I dive into the types to see what's going on. Uh, and so these are the types for uh, this Lambda app. So in the front end message, we've got the increment and, and the decrement, which you would have in the normal counter app. Um, this f no op is just a no op value for us to discard some events that we don't care about. Uh, on the back end side, we've got a client join. So this is what the front end sends to announce that it's joined. Um, and then we've got a counter incremented, and counter decremented. So these are the commands that the client is sending to the back end. So the reason we've done it this way is because uh, we wanted that kind of instant feedback. You press the counter, it goes up in your local browser, but then it also fires um, a message to the, to the backend saying, hey, I've, I've incremented things. And then from uh, on the backend side, there's actually no events. The backend doesn't do anything in and of itself, um, but it does have a two front end message value, which is it sends um, a counter new value over to the end. Is that making sense? Hopefully. Um, so let's just take a look at the code really quickly. Um, this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, I don't think. Um, the model uh, is a counter that's an integer. We initialize that to zero, and then we, uh, on init, send to the back end this client join message, turn up to the back end. Uh, our view is just simply the buttons um, showing the, the model counter. In the update, uh, we are exactly the same as the canonical example with the addition of these uh, Two commands where we on click tell the back end, hey, we've incremented, we've decremented. Now here's the uh, the additional update function to handle messages that have come back from the back end. So whenever the back end sends us a counter new value, we just take that new value and we set it to the counter. It's quite straightforward. Um, and then we will ignore those wrapper functions for later. Um, so how this is all put together, um, this is the Lambda front end application signature. It's exactly the same as the document browser application signature. The only difference is that we have the addition of um, an extra update from backend function, and that's it. So in terms of porting an app uh, onto Lambda, it would be about adding this extra update function, doing the backend, and hopefully everything else should stay largely as is. OK, let's take a look at the backend. So the backend um, won't actually look too dissimilar to a front-end app at all. The only thing that's missing is a view function, but other than that, everything is the same. Uh, so we've got a model where we've got our counter and store the integer, and then we've got a set of client IDs because we track the client IDs to know who's joined and who we're going to send some messages back to. Uh, on initialization, we simply empty those. Uh, on, like I said, on uh, the, the backend update function, there aren't any actual actions um, because the backend really just sits there and worries about uh, these uh, three messages that it gets from the front-end. Uh, so those are client join, uh, which simply inserts uh, that client ID and tracks it, and then sends to the front end what the current counter value is. Um, and if the counter is incremented or the counter is decremented, um, we basically do the same thing. We increment the counter, set it into our model, and then we broadcast to all of the clients what that new value is. And that's about it. The uh, signature for this one is slightly uh, simpler. Um, we've got the init update, update from front end, which is additional, and subscriptions, uh, but we don't need the view and we don't think need the URL changed or, um, yeah, there's, there's a two URL change functions, which are URL change or URL request aren't necessary in the back end. Okay, that's it. So that what we just saw is about uh, 50 lines of code. Um, front end and back end, uh, the types are shared. It's about 120 lines of code to have a multi-user um, persistent counter app. And yeah, I think the persistence we showed, if I just refresh, that's resetting from the back end state. OK, we'll run through a couple more of these now. Uh, so multi-user chat app uh, is the next one. Um, again, similarly, um, we've got chat we can put in 
uh, emojis. I mean, I don't think I need to explain how chat works, hopefully, to anyone. Um, uh, cool. Um, so again, that is a quite straightforward app. Uh, in total, it's only 230 lines of code. That's including the logic uh, and the, the front-end UI. Um, and again, you can see the back-end is quite slim and stuff is shared. So I won't dive into that code, but uh, uh, some of these code examples will be up afterwards, and you can, and you can come and take a look at them. Uh, okay, next demo. This one we really like. Uh, I'm not sure why it's cut off. It's off screen a little bit. Uh, but basically, uh, this is a collaborative markdown editor. So it works in real time. Um, I can put stuff in here. Oh. Is my Wi Fi connection dropped? No. Get some latency or something. Wi-Fi Wi-Fi. Oh. Yeah. OK, it looks like the Wi-Fi has dropped out. That's a shame. I can see both changes. Okay. Okay. Some funny business going on. In any case, I'll just believe that uh, this would uh, um, basically, yeah, that the, the markdown uh, file that's on the left-hand side that's being synchronized through the server and shared with all clients. Um, Philip implemented a uh, like a syncing diffing algorithm to figure out where the conflicts and the changes are, and then on the right-hand side, it just kind of keeps being updated. Uh, so the nice thing is, when this does work, it's just it's like Google Docs but with markdown kind of thing. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going on there at all. Um, okay. Uh, cool. So the Markdown app, uh, again, not, not really too much going on there, about 500 lines in total, most of which is kind of that sync library. So the UI in the back end is still quite straightforward. Uh, okay, let's power through the Last couple. Uh, so this is a to-do app. Um, so most of you are familiar with this, uh, hopefully. Uh, one of Evan's uh, written examples. Um, and so write a new cool Lambda app. I think we can say, we've done that. And uh, maybe some other stuff needs to be done, uh, which is like get a user feedback. And uh, maybe give Kinder to everybody. I don't, I don't know if we have the budget for that. I might just remove that one. Um, yeah, so the, uh, this one is interesting because this was a conversion. So we had an existing app that didn't have a backend. And we thought, uh, what would it take to convert it? How many lines of code? Uh, not that lines of code is, is a necessarily a metric. I think it just hopefully gives you a rough idea of what's going on. Um, but, uh, you know, full disclosure here, this is a professional certified Lambda, a Lambda developer, Philip, um, who, uh, who did this. and. The add and remove, most of that is really just moving types around, putting types kind of in a shared location. Um, so it took Philip all about 30 minutes, including deciding to improve some things in the modeling of the to-do app unrelated to Lambda. So we thought that was pretty cool. Um, OK. Another big piece of the puzzle that I'd like to um, briefly touch on, those of you that were here last year or, or may have seen, I spoke about Evergreen, uh, this notion of having type safety between versions of your apps so we can deploy new versions and not, not, use, uh, lose, uh, not lose user state. Um, and the, the way that Evergreen worked, just as a quick refresher, was that you've got this notion of uh, application one, application two. You've got all your state in application one, and you kind of want to get it across to application two. Um, however, in application two, those types uh, may actually change. So between app one to app two, um, we have this problem. And what the Evergreen talk, uh, what I demoed in that, uh, was a solution to doing that just on the front end. Now, again, the thing that made Evergreen possible was Elm's 
lack of side effects and its immutability, like those properties within Elm and the type safety specifically was allowed us to have these guarantees. Um, but I did at the time speak about the fact that this problem is much larger. You know, we can solve it on the Elm side, but you can't truly solve it until we have some sort of solution for the server side as well. And the complicated bit with that is that, you know, you might have your first version of your app talking to the server, um, and that's fine, but then when you release new versions, they may not be released exactly at the same time. You may have old versions talking to new versions of the back end, or old versions of the back end talking to new versions of the app, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of things uh, to think about here. And again, if you'll notice, the key thing here is that there's boundaries between these. There's gaps, you know, and so we need to interlink those gaps. Uh, so the way that we're approaching this uh, in Lambda is going to be similar to the way that um, Elm approaches its module sembar. So when you're pushing up a new, uh, new module, Elm is taking a look at the source that's currently published, it's taking a look at what you're trying to publish, and Elm tells you this is what your version number is going to be based on the API changes that are in there. So similarly, this is a mock-up of what we're currently working on with uh, Lambda for Evergreen. Um, when you go to deploy your Lambda app, uh, Lambda will check the types that you've currently got in production against the types that you've got on your system that you're trying to deploy. And if those change in a breaking way, so because we've got persistence of your model on the back end and we've got the user's models on the front end that we don't want to lose with a new version, we will see that, oh, you might have changed here in the model. Say we've decided to fix a bug with our counter that was a float and change that to an int. Um, and it'll place a mock migration uh, for you to, to implement. What is that mock migration? Uh, well, it's simply a function. It's a function from type A to type B. So the way that Evergreen works then is Evergreen's already bringing that type from one app to the other, and the missing piece is pushing through that migration function to get um, the new state in your new app. So the way that this problem then will get solved is the front ends and the back ends given they're all in Lambda, and you've got the upgrade functions all the way through. Regardless of what point which gets deployed or who hasn't yet updated, whatever message type you get in, it'll either be the old message type, which we've got a function to upgrade into the new message type that we need on either the server, or either the back end or the front end, um, or you'll have the new message type, which you already know how to handle. Uh, so in that sense, we'll get type safety not only within your front end and back end as a unit, but between versions of your app through time. Okay, I'm going to touch quickly on the uh, future um, and some next steps uh, that uh, we're currently thinking of for Lambda. So the main one is that we're currently in alpha. Um, so the alpha started a couple weeks ago. It's a closed alpha um, because uh, this is a side project for us, so it does take a lot of time, um, and uh, we're currently just managing it, uh, myself and Philip. Uh, but yeah, big reminder, this is very much alpha software, um, definitely non-production use cases. Um, <laughs> Uh, the Evergreen migration system is not part of it yet, so you need to be prepared for not having data guarantees. Um, so the kind of things that we think this will be really great for is the kind of demos that we've shown, uh, especially games, like those, those of you in the game dev community, um, you know, if there's, if there's things that you want to make persistence, we live, really love uh, that idea. Um, things where you're happy to reset that data, or if you make model changes that are breaking, um, you're happy to reset that data because there's no concept of Evergreen to upgrade your model states. Um, so please do come and speak to us, um, especially if you've got a use case, I'd love to know. Um, but you can also um, uh, register at lambda.com and uh, also for those watching this video later. Uh, so yeah, on the use cases again, uh, where we think Lambda will work best right now is if you've got um, kind of need for just a back end, it's not something that's um, uh, needs to be super um, super formal. You've got small data sets, so stuff that might be kind of less than 100 megabytes, whatever that might mean to you conceptually. Um, and if you want the infrastructure and the deployment stuff kind of taken care of. One thing I do want to touch on before I talk about some principles is, uh, like I said at the beginning of the talk, that, that this problem was motivated by a problem that we had that we're solving for ourselves. Uh, so one of the principles that we're trying to apply is building Lambda entirely on Lambda, or at least whenever there's a web development problem within Lambda, building that on, on our own platform. Um, so we're hoping this will keep us kind of close to the problem and help us understand like what things need to be there next and, and what kind of the pain points are. Um, so you'll see, especially in the alpha, like a lot of the assets and stuff, they're all being built on Lambda, and ideally eventually we'll um, open up those that aren't sensitive um, as code examples as well. Okay, so lastly, I just want to touch on some principles. Um, so we really love Elm. Um, uh, so a, a really important part of this for us uh, was, as I mentioned in my talk synopsis, there's been a lot of talk over the years about, oh, let's take Elm and put it on the server. Um, and I think maybe 
those discussions have kind of gone in various ways and uh, maybe uh, Elm's direction isn't necessarily um, geared towards that. And I think at a surface level, it's kind of hard to see the really intricate problems that exist in doing that. Um, so we've been experiencing that for a while. Um, but uh, in, in, in doing that, um, we, you know, we've been speaking to Evan and some of the other uh, kind of uh, community leaders and stuff and thinking like, how do we bring Lambda to this community without it being like a divisive thing um, so that it stays experimental and interesting rather than being um, something that we're like, oh, this is the way it should be done. Uh, so uh, as a result of that, um, one of the things we've decided is Lambda will be commercial, at least to start. Um, so it's going to remain closed and it's going to be something that we experiment with. Um, uh, uh, we're going to keep it a strict superset of Elm. We'd like, hopefully, to not need to do any major language modifications. Um, there will be some things in there, like obviously the Evergreen system needs to be baked into the tooling somehow, um, but overall, hopefully, um, there won't be any differences whatsoever in terms of the actual language. So Elm apps are Lambda are apps just with the back end missing. Um, the implementation is abstracted. Um, I haven't really talked about it today. That's because we kind of feel like that's not really the important bit, especially because we already know even the proof of concept that we have now that everything's running on, it's, it's going to change. Um, but we are proud that the backend has no JavaScript, no Node.js, nothing of that sort there at all. Um, so that was one of our design goals uh, starting uh, early on, and we've, we've preserved that. Um, so that's really exciting for us. Um, and we also think that forks should have uh, economic disincentives. Um, so eventually, we're fairly sure we're going to probably get into realms where we need to fix problems in Lambda that maybe aren't fixed in mainline Elm yet. Um, so the way that we're thinking about doing this is that in order to get access to those, um, there's an economic disincentive to use those longer term, and it gets progressively more expensive. So the way, same way that Microsoft does um, end of life and stuff. Uh, because again, our goal is really to keep close to Elm, not to create another fork that goes off in a different direction. OK, so the last thing is uh, services that we're kind of thinking of. So right now, those primitives are quite, quite small. There's a lot of stuff that um, I think you can build, but uh, there's potentially a lot more um, a lot more use cases for things outside of that. Some of these we're going to run into ourselves very quickly um, just in building Lambda. Um, so we're, we've already started thinking about what these primitives could look like as functions in Elm and how that might work. Um, so yeah, things like email, file uploads, images, like you know, what, what is the API for that? How does it look? How does it feel? Um, request response semantics, do we need them? Maybe, I'm not sure. You could build them on top of the primitives we have now, but it might be a bit clunky. Uh, authentication, again, like what is everybody's different use cases? Is there like a general set of tooling that helps um, people get going with that, or do we just leave it for everybody to bake it in? Custom domains and onwards. So in terms of the use cases, if you have an idea or if there's something that you would really want to build on this, but you're prevented by some particular feature or something, that's the kind of stuff that we're really interested in hearing about at the moment. Oh, one more thing so that will leave you on a, on a final, uh, final drop. Um, so Philip uh, this week uh, has been working with uh, I only know his handle, it's Malex. It's it's Manuel, Manuel, um, uh, who's speaking up, who's speaking next um, on on the Game Boy emulator. And suddenly thought was like, man, this Game Boy emulator is really cool. But when you're four hours into Zelda and you accidentally command Q and hit your browser close, like ah, oh, it's the worst. Now you've lost four hours of Zelda. So wouldn't it be really cool if uh, you could actually save your game state? So here is. Um, Elm Boy on Lambda, so that was me refreshing, I'll do it again. Um, and that is a game save state being pulled back from the server and refreshed into the Game Boy. And uh, just to prove that this is working, maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll jump. I'm really terrible at this game. Oh, I made it. OK, so let me hit the save button. Hopefully that's saved in the back end. And so if we refresh this now, we should get our sheep at the bottom. There we go. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. We look forward to um, chatting you guys about this. Thank you.